right, I think everyone is here. So welcome in everyone, whether it's your good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, because we are indeed spanning multiple time zones today. Um, welcome in. My name is Tara Sprague. I'm the Deputy Director of the Education and Small States Research Group here at the University of Bristol. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today for this session titled Voices from SIDS at the Sharp End of Environmental Uncertainty. Small Island Developing States Speak to COP26. So today's event is jointly hosted by a number of groups. We want to extend thank you to everyone who's been involved in hosting us today. This is a University of Bristol School of Education, Bristol Conversations in Education Research Seminar. And the, we're also hosted by the Center for Comparative and International Research and Education, the Education in Small States Research Group, and the Cabot Institute for the Environment. So many thanks to all of the groups who've been involved in getting today's session together for hosting us. And we want to say a special thank you to Christy Smith and Francesca Mahong from the School of Education, who have been really helpful in getting us set up helping us with all of the just logistics and promoting today's event. So the purpose of today's event is to hear from a range of voices from the, those living at the sharp end of environmental uncertainty. And those are those living within small island developing states, which are some of the most vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. So when, um, countries meet together in Glasgow at COP26. We want these voices to be heard. And so today we're going to be recording this session to make an edited version, which will be hosted on the Cabot Institute um, YouTube channel with the aim of getting this into the hands of those who will actually be at the COP, at the Conference of Parties. So to this end, we're going to have presentations from the three regions of small island developing states. From the Indian Ocean, we will be hearing from the Maldives. From the Caribbean, we will be hearing from St. Lucia. And from the Pacific Ocean, we'll be hearing from Tuvalu. But first, for a few more words of welcome and to orient us to today's session, I want to hand over to Professor Michael Crossley, the Director of the Education Small States Research Group, and also we'll hear from Professor Dan Mitchell, who is Professor of Climate Science at the Cabot Institute, before we get on to our video presentations from the three regions. So over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Tara. And yeah, welcome everyone from many time zones across the globe. Uh, my role is just to help provide some context for today's event and tell you just a little bit about the Education in Small States Research Group. Uh, the ESSRG is a global international network that was founded almost 30 years ago. And since then, we've been engaged with the distinctive educational, environmental and development challenges faced by small island developing states. We have a large membership in small states worldwide and a strong track record. So if you would like to know more about this, then please visit our website. And that is at www.smallstates.org. Net. Specific attention has been given in our research to the priorities and achievements of SIDS and most specifically to what the international community can learn from their distinctive experience at what we have collectively called the sharp end of environmental uncertainty. It is in this spirit that today's event has been planned with our aim to bring together a diversity of voices from the sharp end to contribute directly to the COP26 deliberations. And I'm particularly pleased that our presentations will feature research and voices from the Maldives in the Indian Ocean and Tuvalu in the Pacific, two nations that face existential challenges and national inundation if sea level ri rises by just two meters. In collaboration with the Cabot Institute for the Environment, we hope that the video recordings from today's presentations will find their way into the November discussions at COP26 in Glasgow. And to provide more information on COP itself, I'm now pleased to introduce Dan Mitchell, Professor of Climate Science at the Cabot Institute for the Environment here at the University of Bristol. 
And thank you for joining us today, Dan. Thanks, Michael, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to chair this session uh, with three really great speakers covering a wide range of uh, geographical locations. And so just a little bit about Cabot. Um, we're a cross-disciplinary group here at Bristol. We have over 600 scientists on board. And our idea is really to take environmental change from the theoretical understanding. Um, so we do climate models and we look at how the fundamental fluids of the atmosphere change all the way through to the sort of decisions and the societal changes um, that climate change affects. And climate change does encompass all of those different strands. And so we don't sit in a, a single department. We sit in departments across um, the university and faculties um, in, in social sciences, health sciences, uh, physical sciences, and engineering. So we really do cover a wide range of things. We do have a presence at COP as well, and, and a number of us are going this year. Um, we do quite a bit of climate research on small island development states. And in fact, my team went out to Jamaica just before COVID. Um, and we're working with Professor Michael Taylor out there. And uh, we were looking at how tropical cyclones might change under climate change and how that feeds into a whole wealth of different disasters. And I know I, I'm preaching to people who know a lot more about what those disasters look like in the Caribbean. Um, so really important things going on there. So what is COP and why is it important? COP is an annual meeting. Um, it's the annual meeting on climate change run by the United Nations. And this is really the key meeting where decisions can happen on climate change uh, and where governments can come together. More often than not, things don't happen at COP. Um, and we often call them failed COPs versus um, successful COPs. And unfortunately, I could count only uh, on one hand what we would class as successful COPs. Um, but Kyoto uh, in the uh, mid 1990s was the first really successful COP. Um, and then Copenhagen uh, sort of 15 years later. And then much more recently, Paris. And Paris was a really interesting one because, you know, Small island developing states, I would argue, really changed the agenda in Paris. And the reason they changed the agenda was um, small increases in temperature affect them more than more, almost any other uh, geographical location in the world. And they very successfully argued that we shouldn't be limiting global climate warming to two degrees because at two degrees, a lot of their islands are underwater. And in fact, we should strive for one and a half degrees. So I would argue that it was the small island development state that really got that 1.5 degrees uh, in, the, in the Paris Agreement. So it's great to have them here. Um, I won't say much more other than, uh, you know, it's great to have all three of our speakers. Dame Perlette was actually alumni here at Bristol, so it's it's especially nice to see you, Perlette. We haven't met before, but I, you know, I would hope that we do in the future. Um, and I look forward to hearing all three of your talks. So I'll hand over to you guys. Thank you so much, Dan. It's really helpful to have that background information about the Capital Institute, but also the reminder of how influential have been within the COP deliberations, particularly because they're phenomenal at binding together in regional and across regional groupings to really influence um, the deliberations going on. And we hope that today's voices can, all, can carry on um, that, that legacy. So the first of the three video presentations, we're going to run them back to back with um, someone just introducing each one briefly. So keep your um, questions coming in through the chat, which we will get to towards the end of today's session. So uh, we'll have the three video presentations, a response from Dan Mitchell again to those presentations and then uh, with the balance of the time Q&A. So I'd like to um, first draw our attention to the Maldives where we have doctors Amanath Luna and Amanath Shimi, uh, alums here from Bristol University and um, members of the leadership team of the Education and Small States Research Group and Shimi is based at the University of Maldives. So 
Muna, I'd like to ask you to introduce briefly your video. We'll run the video and then um, Shimmy, I think, will say a brief concluding word. So Muna, over to you. Thank you, Tara. The contribution to this session from the Maldives is in the form of a video presentation. We compile the video aiming to bring to you the multitude and diversity of the voices of the, in the Maldives their everyday experiences and anxieties about the environment and the climate change. These voices come from a range of contributors from different levels of the society, varying from school children to policy makers. We were not able to travel to many islands as traveling was costly and time consuming. So we reached out to our colleagues on various islands to provide us with brief videos, capturing their sentiments and their concerns. However, we went, we went out to Himafushi and Rasto Island, where they were most welcoming and helped us extensively in our interviews. The compiled video we present today is a compilation of these videos, a collage of these voices. As is evident, climate anxiety is up close and personal for all who we had the opportunity to talk to. We hope we are able to convey an idea of the level of awareness amongst the Maldivian people of the threats and challenges posed by climate change to their livelihoods and existence. All these interviews have been edited into a 12 minute video, which we'll play now. So let's watch and listen to their voices. Thank you. for my bunny. A place we should keep safe and clean. How they depend on me. We know that we are not going to be able to do anything. We are not going to be able to do anything. Well, I am from the Maldives and of course when I, when I think of the environment, it, it is obvious that I'm thinking of our islands, our coral reefs, the ocean around us. The trees, it, basically the nature around us. Um, and I... What does environment mean to me? Um, environment means everything to me, because, uh, especially the ocean environment. Uh, personally, I've, I've uh, been in the ocean for the last, uh, since I was a kid, so ocean has been my playground. And, uh, you know, it's kind of my soul in it. Yes, I think climate change is real. I don't think the younger generation is yet that much fully aware of the climate changes, but I'm really sure that they can be aware because they are in the younger generation, they are going to be studying a lot of about that. And I, I really think that they will make a big impact on climate change because they are the hope of this future generation. Being in tourism for the last 40 years plus, our experiences are quite substantial from a personal experience. We had the opportunity to get into resorts, 
we never had to plan for shore protection even 25 30 years ago five years ago uh, we bid for an island uh, where again the shore protection was not a major aspect once we started construction the shore protection has become one of the most critical one of the highest single investment that is required now you have to build for in excess of 100 kilometer winds you have to raise the ground level well above to rise and hit the bottom of the water villas so the impact is quite severe we have to invest on things we have never thought about investing and now we have to accept the environmental impact as a reality and plan for it Amdaniya badala the mahan nufred vasta kina vi madeng. Amdaniya smadwan jide. Badala amdani. We talk about climate change and we talk about the oceans and we are the oceans. So if anything happens to the oceans, uh, we feel it first. Without even knowing it, we feel it. For example, when the weather when we get bad weather, strong winds, we feel it. You know, because we call it sea level rise, people uh, might be a bit disconnected to what is happening here because sea level rise, they will think sea is suddenly rising. But what is happening is climate change is happening, weather is changing. Our country is two feet above sea level, so we will be losing a lot to these weather changes. And before the sea level really can rise to do something more, they would not be there by the time. So we need to connect people to what is happening. Maldives has actually a very strong policy on our environment in general, but we, we fail to implement it. We actually fail to really see through it. A policy is easily exceptionalized. Uh, for example, a reclamation project. So there's a wavering uh, contradiction to, to the policy we have. So we fail to administer the policies and, and, and that we need to advocate a bit stronger. Um, not making new policies but actually enforcing the current policies we have. The easiest part of a policy is to formulate a new policy but the most difficult part is to actually uh, implement a policy and to, to have a few good ones that we don't waive or give an exception on the rule. Um, <laughs> Four months ago, I was in Mafahi, our agriculture project island, when that major storm broke, uh, wind gusts were regularly hitting 95 kilometers per hour. Out of a plantation of about 4,000 banana pits, there was not one single pit that was not affected. Uh, at the end of the three-day storm period, we had about 2,500 plants broken. We were bringing to Male 200 bunches a week. Last week, we had none. Our country is not made for those and we have had very recent experience continuing to experience the huge changes that environment is bringing to this country. For a Moldavian, first of all, for us to even exist, we have to really care about the environment because climate change is so real to a country like us. We are barely two meters above the sea level and we are one of the most vulnerable to climate change and its impacts. Uh, 
ahanna ekani evves kavannu kore vene e ahar ben miule huriha mmv gen kore vene masakkat stop using plastic and start using recyclable product me do kues beach fab afa kome setche genas das pinadu evya kurum kore vene kantatta ka mauduma to dinuma new generation natto emiyun asu build gokke mi become boda helpful one by not spreading plastic bags on the turtles or any other various animals in the water jinya hi rakka kore veni urihani hum ebbar jaage mi huriya ma sai gate veni ne guma huni en huni en duma de honu ga jama honu ga jama de armen rakka ayye hi jabe nu honu ga jama the start i would like to say that the moldis has recently passed a climate emergency act because we feel that the situation is so dire that we need to make sure that climate change is reflected across all of our sectors and it is incorporated in all of our regulations so the the importance of climate emergency bill is that that this gives us an opportunity in the government to ensure that climate change is mainstreamed across all sectors so this means it will be addressed in tourism in agriculture in construction uh, education health when we um, updated our most recent uh, nationally determined contributions to the UNFCCC uh, for the upcoming cop we have also declared our intention to be a net zero country in 2030 which is very very ambitious for a small country like the moldes uh, we want to show the world that we are willing to take every policy decision to make sure that we do our part in ensuring that we keep the global temperatures from rising beyond 1.5 degrees so in addition the moldes is also preparing its national adaptation plans one of the things that important is that we want to make sure all of the sectors ensure resilience is factored into their um their plans so i believe that this gives a legal push uh, is important for for us in strengthening the resilience uh, overall ahar mein gaumaki murak fartabu ko mufadfa wa gaum ahar mein na ahar mein gadarin na Thank you all for watching the video with us. As we can see there's a diverse range of voices of concerns, hopes and dreams about our environment among us Moldivians. The collective argument is that the threat we face is real, so we need to act. Act now to make a change to save ourselves and to save the earth. To address this session today among the audience we have experts on environment management from the Maldives including Mr. Riaz Jauhari from the Marine Research Center. He has published extensively on tuna fish population and sustainable fisheries in the Maldives as well as on environment management in the Maldives. I believe he will have some contributions to add to the latter part of today's event. In conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone who helped us with the video at all the different levels of its production. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience again for watching the video with us. 
And now over to you, Tara, to continue with the session. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Muna and Shimi, for producing that um, wonderful video, which really gave us a range, quite a range of voices that uh, want to be heard at COP. Thank you for that very much contribution from the Maldives. Uh, we're now going to turn to the Caribbean, where we're going to have a presentation again by a video pre-prepared by Dame Perlette Louise, the Emerita Governor General of St. Lucia and longtime member of the Education and Small States Research Group, together with Dr. Merle St. Clair Auguste, who is the Vice Principal of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. Dame Perlette, would you like to introduce your video? Um, yes, thank you, um, Tara. Um, the, our presentation this, this morning is entitled Living at the Sharp End, the Impact of Climate Change in the Caribbean with special reference to the education sector. When Dr. Well, Professor Crossley invited me to, to participate, he did mention, uh, he did suggest that I could do something on education and I was, I was happy. Um, to take that angle because while we always talk about re climate resilience and we do infrastructural works or risk management, we, we tend to forget sometimes, I think, that people need to be taught. They need to be introduced to the whole concept of, of sustainability and resilience and so on. So this is why um, myself and, and, and Mul um, prepared this, this presentation. And um, I would like to thank, uh, in particular, the Sustainable Development Unit of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States for a lot of the material and source material from which we um, drew our, our impressions, our information, and also from the, the Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program in St. Lucia um, for some of the ways in which local communities could get involved in um, climate change, adaptation and, and mitigation. So, so now um, I, I would like to present uh, the, the, the video that the two of us prepared. One point five to stay alive. This was the stark reality presented to the international community by the small island developing states of the Caribbean when they met in Paris for COP21. The islands argued then that their very survival depended on the world's collective commitment to ensure that average temperatures do not increase by more than 1.5 degrees, and that sea level rise does not increase by more than 1.5 meters before the middle of the century. Jonathan Gladding's graphic representation of the Caribbean's future generation being barely able to keep its head above water speaks to the precarious nature of life in this island archipelago at the sharp end of environmental uncertainty and to the dire implications if mitigation and adaptation issues are not urgently addressed. Last month at the United Nations General Assembly, the Prime Minister of Barbados in an impassioned address put this question again to the international community. She asked, who will stand up for the small island developing states who need 1.5 degrees to survive as we go to COP26? Who, who will stand up? Her call for global, moral, and strategic leadership in climate change mitigation and adaptation can no longer be ignored. For its part, the Caribbean has been very proactive in addressing some of these issues on its own. Regional initiatives, strategies, and frameworks continue to be put in place to manage its responses 
to the many challenges posed by climate change. The most recent initiative is the State of the Caribbean Climate Report, produced in 2020 for the Caribbean Development Bank. This initiative was preceded by the establishment of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, the Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Environmental and Sustainable Development Unit, among others. The State of the Caribbean Climate Report was a regional collaborative effort undertaken by the University of the West Indies Climate Studies Group in Mona, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, and the Cuban Meteorological Institute. It was prepared to strengthen the strategic planning and decision-making processes that will be required to accelerate resilience building efforts in the Caribbean, specifically within the 19 borrowing member countries of the Caribbean Development Bank. The projections for the Caribbean are for rising sea levels, hotter temperatures, more variable rainfall with increased drying, increased sea surface temperatures, and more intense Category 4 and 5 hurricanes. Today's presentation will draw on the data and the analysis of the state of climate change and the predictions outlined in that report with specific focus on the education sector, since in the opinion of the authors, the Caribbean's education sector is among the most critical sectors for consideration for present and the projected impacts of climate change, given its impact on future generations. Dr. Merle St. Laogist, Vice Principal of the St. Arthur Lewis Community College here in St. Lucia, will now speak to the impact of climate change on the education sector as outlined in the report. This section of the presentation will speak specifically to the most significant climate change variables outlined in the report and the impact of these variables on education in the Caribbean as well as to some recommendations already proposed by the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States in a report entitled Development of Design Guidelines for Disaster Resilient Schools in the OECS as part of UNICEF's global initiative, Save Schools in Safe Territories, Reflections on the Role of the Educational Community in Risk Management. Increasing temperature can interrupt and limit the learning process. Without calling aids in our learning environment, student body temperatures are affected. The corresponding effects on work performance and attentiveness leads to a decline in productivity. Additionally, youth educational development is further complicated, where formative skills such as reading speed, comprehension, and mathematical performance are arrested. Increasing temperature and precipitation is central to the emergence of vector-borne diseases such as chikungunya and Zika viruses. These diseases have affected student and teacher attendance as well as the productivity of the labor force in the Caribbean. An example from Jamaica, which occurred in 2014, is highlighted in the report, where students were absent from school for extended periods due to the aforementioned diseases. The hurricane season is uncertain and affects the general operation of schools with severe implications for academic performance, with a negative effect on student performance in mathematics, biology, chemistry, and physics in the Caribbean examinations. This is attributed to the number of hurricanes occurring during the year, which will more likely decrease classroom time, supervising the practice of mathematical problems and conducting labs. However, there is no significant impact observed with subjects in humanities. Hurricanes and flooding adversely affect school infrastructure as well as roads, interruptions in water and electricity supply which in turn affects school attendance. History shows 
that the school term has been severely affected by hurricane activities for upwards of a month. There are examples from the Cayman Islands in 2004 and more recently the Commonwealth of Dominica after Hurricane Maria in 2017. From 1993, major school structures have been affected by hurricanes. With increased intensity, the number of damaged school structures throughout the region has increased. With school structures in close proximity to the coast, they are among the most vulnerable to floods and effects of sea level rise in the Caribbean region. The report states that from 2009 to 2015, prolonged drought conditions in the Caribbean have caused closure due to hygiene and sanitation concerns. This is exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Droughts affect local agriculture, which is a primary support for school feeding programs. The report covers significant climate information and data. However, there are critical data-related gaps that need to be addressed as the region seeks to employ evidence-based approaches to decision-making. These data challenges are linked to inadequate coverage of weather and a climatological station which is required to improve continuous monitoring and analysis of key variables for over 30 years. There is also need for information to support effective decision making to improve resilience and sustainability strategies. The report recommends three simple measures or principles that can strengthen decision making and they include the commitment of national and regional decision makers that's within government, private sector, civil society, academia and other relevant stakeholder groups to commit to working together to decide upon and achieve agreed climate resilience targets, to employ evidence-based approaches as well as adaptive and scenario planning in support of decision making, to support and strengthen existing expertise and resilience building initiatives and use these to guide decision making processes. A few lessons to guide the region was also shared. The first, plan for the current climate, but be guided by the lessons of the past. Plan for the future climate, but do so collaboratively. Prioritize harnessing and enhancing regional strengths and expertise in support of improved decision making. I will wrap up with a few considerations from the development of design guidelines for disaster resilient schools in the OECS as part of UNICEF's global initiative, Safe Schools in Safe Territories, Reflections on the Role of the Educational Community in Risk Management. Given the above climate variables outlined by the report, the complementary OECS document states that there are two types of factors, structural and non-structural, which are required when considering if a school is safe. Structural factors include the physical buildings, where the school is located, attendant furniture and equipment, and quality of maintenance provided. Non-structural factors refer to the educational institution's attitude on the wider world, on humanity, especially its own students and teachers, on the teaching and learning process, on relationships between the community and the school, and on itself. To further the holistic approach employed by the OECS document, specific improvements include locating schools in the least threatened or impacted zones or areas. Disaster plans when established must also include revision schedules tied to the national emergency systems with regular testing as part of early response of a wider resilience framework. National education systems need to plan and implement long-term annual effective maintenance supported with a realistic budget that allows for regular inspection and maintenance efforts. Without an effective maintenance effort and accompanying realistic budget, resilience will be compromised. The foregoing are national and regional long-term recommendations to consider and implement collaboratively.
We must therefore acknowledge the significant efforts that have been made by the Caribbean to identify some of the challenges and issues which impact the education sector. However, the problem has been and continues to be one of implementation, either for lack of resources or for lack of engagement of the local community. At a recent symposium on the integration of research and innovation into sustainable development processes, which was held in St. Lucia in November 2020, the Global Manager for the Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Project of the United Nations Development Program reiterated the role of the project in promoting and nurturing innovative solutions with the local communities to address and to combat the immense global environmental challenges that we face today. The Jeff argues, and rightly so, that such solutions should extend beyond the white coat and lab to local communities that hold rich traditional knowledge and innovative ideas that should be supported and scaled up. To support this assessment of the capacity of some of these indigenous communities, I would like to speak to three projects that have been designed and successfully implemented by community-based organizations in St. Lucia, which, if upscaled, could help address some of the challenges which the education sector must confront. Funding for these projects was provided by the Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program of the UNDP. All three can be replicated in other communities in St. Lucia and the Caribbean, as well as in other small island developing states to build local resilience. The first project is the Life Cube which is a solar-powered mobile desalination facility developed by a young fisherman from the village of Lambury and implemented by the local fishermen's cooperative to provide potable water in times of crisis and to provide a ready and reliable source of water for the community. A second generation facility, much smaller and more productive has since been exported to the island of Nauru in the Pacific. The second project is a rainwater harvesting system aimed at reducing the impacts of drought exacerbated by climate change in three rural communities. Buta, which is used to suffer from a water deficit of 29% per day, and Lamaz and Monzi, which used to receive one hour of pipe borne water once a week from the national supplier. And the third project is the establishment of sustainable energy cells using solar as an alternative energy source to assist a group of vulnerable households in the community of Swazel who are having difficulty to meet the cost of their monthly electricity bills. That project, as well as one of the rainwater harvesting systems referred to earlier, was implemented by a youth group from the community. These three projects point to our indigenous capacity to adapt to some of the challenges posed by climate change. What is needed is financial and technical support to implement and sustain them. Funding for the upscaling of projects such as these is already provided for in the Special Climate Change Fund administered by the Global Environmental Facility, which financed the three projects that I have just presented. Indeed, the fund, while open to all vulnerable developing countries, prioritizes the needs of those in Africa, Asia, and small island developing states in climate change adaptation activities and the transfer of climate resilient technology for both mitigation and adaptation in the areas of research 
and implementation of demonstration and deployment projects. However, what is urgently needed is greater ease of access to the fund by community-based organizations in our small island developing states. Greater consideration must also be given to capacity building of civil society and community-based organizations to enable them to drive these climate resilience efforts. In this regard, education for sustainable development and resilience building has to be mainstreamed at all levels of the education sector, from the early learning sector through to primary, secondary, and the higher education sector, and lifelong learning initiatives in the formal as well as in the informal sector. I therefore want to end with a special message for COP26. Since the education sector is listed among the most critical sectors for consideration for present and projected impacts of climate change because of its impact on future generations, every effort must be made to mainstream education for sustainability at all levels. The international community needs to identify one of its agencies with a proven record in education planning and management in small island developing states to drive and coordinate that effort. Really, there is not much time left. Thank you so much, Dame Prolette and Marl, for that uh, wonderful contribution. You've drawn our attention. I'm seeing hand clapping going on. You've drawn our attention to um, some recent research across the whole region of the Caribbean and um, identified some projects that you're suggesting could be implemented elsewhere and also made a really clear clarion call for the COP about the role of education in this. So. Um, I want to just remind everyone that our presenters, those who develop the videos, will be taking your questions following um, the last video, which we'll have in a moment, and a response from Professor Mitchell. So please do put your questions in the chat, and we'll endeavor to address as many of those as we can. So thank you again um, to our contribution from the Caribbean. And now we're going to turn to the Pacific region, and it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Rosie Loggi, who's with us from the University of the South Pacific. Rosie is currently serving as a deputy head of the School of Education at the University of the South Pacific, a regional university, and she's prepared a video for us um, from Tuvalu. So Rosie, over to you to say a few words about that video. Thank you. All right. Um, well, talofa, everyone. Come na panin Maori. Bulavinak and Namaste, it's almost midnight here in Fiji, but it is wonderful to be able to be the voice of our people in this discussion. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy the short video uh, highlighting the concerns of our elders and children uh, who are living at the sharp end of uh, climate and environment uncertainty in um, Tuvalu. Um, um, it's part of the introduction of the video, uh, uh, they will tell you more about what's uh, coming and I hope um, uh, that um, you'll enjoy it and also learn from the experiences um, and the concerns of our people. Bulavinaka and greetings from the South Pacific. We are pleased to contribute Pacific Voices for today's ESSRG event for COP26. In July this year, the University of the South Pacific Tuvalu campus, in partnership with the Foundation for Youth Development and the Jeff S. G. P. Mission in Tuvalu, 
launched a video documentary focusing on the voices of the Tuvaluan elders as they sautala or tell their stories on their traditional ways of forecasting weather. The video, in a nutshell, highlights that traditional ecological knowledge is an integral part of their survival. Traditional ecological knowledge, according to the video, is acquired from nature and it is taught generationally through observation, orally, in the forms of songs, stories, poetries, dances, and through cultural practices. At the heart of traditional ecological knowledge is a notion of wisdom that inspires the effective use of this knowledge. Tuvalu is the fourth smallest island nation in the world. It consists of five atolls and four coral reef islands. The average height of the islands is less than two meters above sea level, with the highest point being about 4.6 meters. If the sea level continues to rise, Tuvalu is predicted to sink by 2050. This video will take a snapshot of the video titled Traditional Ecological Knowledge of Weather Forecasting, Climate Change Mitigation in Tuvalu. We will hear elders from the eight island communities in Tuvalu talk about how they use natural indicators to forecast weather. More so, they mentioned that the traditional indicators have helped save their lives in the past. However, there is fear that climate change may cause the extinction of natural indicators. One of the foundations of their knowledge, culture, Tunua, and their very existence. First, let's see what the elders say are the traditional indicators for a cyclone or strong wind. Next, we will hear about the traditional indicators for rain. Yeah. 
Then we will learn about the traditional indicators for a drought. Now, the elders elaborate on the traditional indicators for a tidal wave. At this point, the elders will enlighten us with the traditional indicators for fine weather. <laughs> According to the video, the traditional ecological knowledge of weather forecasting is shared in community meetings, workshops and woven into the school curriculum. However, while it is documented and passed on generationally, there is a concern that they may lose the natural indicators due to the increase in temperature. <laughs> Yes, I 
Yolo tou whenua tonu, yolo tou tai maasani, tūn fai fai ngā maasani. Me nā hoki mo mea kai loko lai maasani loki e tino tūwalu. Mā tō e mānako ki tūku waka mo tō tama, i te o lānga file mū. Se mana pa se o whakatoka ne mea mo lo tō langa langa mana fai ko whonu ki mo tō whenua i te wai. Te lā lā. E whakamole mo lea tūlo ki takitaki o te lā langi. Fai te kai fak ngā lua tū lā fono, o fak ano fō ngā lā. Ka te soso ani ki tū palu, o nisi atu whenu a pili mai ki runga i a mātou. O te mea ke wafai le mātou ho olai si o lā ngā whia whia. Kai fak ngā māli. The survival of Tū Valu, their identity, culture and sovereignty is in your hands, leaders. If our people are given climate justice, access to relevant and practical climate policies and genuine interventions. Our children, our future, will get to enjoy the same things that we value and treasure today. those voices of the Tuvalu and elders. It's a real honor to be able to hear from them. Um, and if you have a link to the full documentary, because as you mentioned, this is part of a full documentary, if that could be, um, if you do have a link and want to put that in the chat, I'm sure people would like to go and watch the full length um, that's online. And similar with the other presenters, if there are links to the reports to which you reference or anything that you want to share, um, please just put links and, and things in the chat alongside of um, the questions that are going to be coming in from those who are here. But at this time, I'd like to invite Professor Dan Mitchell to come back and make a response. Um, again, if coming in late, Dan Mitchell is with, here with us with the Cabot Institute, and he's a professor of climate change in the School of Geography. So Dan, over to you for a few minutes of response to these wonderful presentations from the three regions of SIDS. Yeah, thanks Tara, and thanks very much for all of the three talks. I mean, I was just absolutely blown away by all three. You, we often say when we, when we watch talks, if, if you take away one important point, we've done well. Well, I've listed at least 10 important points from each talk, so I'm not going to be able to cover them all in a, in a quick summary, but as an indicator of just how great they were. I, I'll start with the Maldives, and the thing that really struck me, and this is a direct quote, was, was we are the oceans. And, and that says a lot, you know, for, for SIDS, that anything that changes the ocean that will change their local weather and climate. And that came across really strongly in the Maldives, you know, and noting that you know, a lot of their infrastructure was in a hundred meters of the coast, any sea level rise could really, really impact that. And they talked a lot about tourism as one of those key impacts. Uh, obviously that's a, that's a big source of money for the country as well. That's uh, so very, very important. It was interesting to hear that they, they do have a lot of climate change policies and I draw, you know, I draw parallels with the UK here. Their main concern was that these are not being implemented very well or, or at all. And again, we draw parallels with ours. Uh, net zero by 2030, I thought was absolutely amazing. I'd be very interested to hear from uh, the speaker if they think that's achievable. Um, uh, it's, you know, that's only nine, uh, nine years away, so that'd be really interesting to see that. Uh, it was also interesting to see uh, that plastics were mentioned quite a lot. I guess 
not a direct climate change problem, but certainly a, a very important environmental problem. And um, it's interesting to see how much that featured in the video. Moving on to the Caribbean, you know, another very important quote, 1.5 to stay alive was mentioned straight away. And it's something that many of us would have heard a lot that's come out of the Caribbean and a, a particularly striking graphic of a, of a young lady sort of underwater there with her head just above um, really does capture it. it. And it draws home that these aren't just numbers, these aren't just temperature numbers. You know, people are dying um, here. And so it was, it was really important to raise that, that point. Uh, one, one thing I thought really interesting here was that there was a detectable change in the output from the sciences and the maths within the Caribbean, but not the humanities. And there wasn't an explanation given, but I'd be very interested to hear more about why they feel it, it's impacting uh, different parts of the education system in different ways. I guess the other thing that was particularly important to be mentioned were, were things like vector-borne diseases. And of course, again, we have some of those in the UK, but very different types of disease. Um, and, and changes in weather patterns change those diseases, and they saw that being uh, translated into school attendance. One final thing from the Caribbean were, was about the drought. Um, and a very important point was raised that the effects of droughts were significantly enhanced because of COVID-19. And that's a very, very uh, clear trend that we've been quoting a lot is climate change is always there in the background. And we're going to have these other crises on top of it. And COVID-19 is a classic one where you've got then two very, very powerful crises interacting. Moving on to, to Fiji, very impressed with um, how awake the uh, speaker was considering it was midnight there. Um, you know, absolutely blown away with some of the uh, forecasting techniques used uh, in Fiji. And uh, as an atmospheric scientist, of course, I challenged myself every time an elder said, uh, we use this indicator. I thought, well, what's going on in the atmosphere which causes that change? Some of them I didn't really understand. So I, I would love to try and figure that out. But starting with uh, crazy black ants moving uh, was a really uh, interesting indicator, learning off, off the, the ecology of the, uh, of the region as to why things are changing. And then directions of birds and um, uh, the height that they're flying, you know, a lot of these make quite a bit of sense from a meteorological point of view. But, but I guess myself and I, I suspect many of you have never thought of it in these terms. So, it, you know, it was really, really nice. Um, <clears throat> and then also using uh, nighttime weather as well to, to predict these things, such as uh, uh, the, the thick circles around the moons and, and the indication of uh, heavy rain coming. And then I was particularly intrigued to know a little bit more about some of the secret knowledge that one of the elders mentioned. Um, I suspect there's a hell of a lot more we could learn there as well. So, so three really great talks, and they did give very different perspectives, I felt, but together they, they, they all added something which is very, very alien to what we think of in, in the UK as climate change. And I think it's getting an, across that alien sort of feeling into COP where people come from such different communities uh, is the challenge. Um, it was very, very well done for Paris and let's hope it can be done really well for Glasgow. So with, with that, I'll hand over to the audience for questions. Thanks so much, Dan, for giving us some specific reflections and points from each of the videos. And I'm sure that the um, presenters are thinking about some responses to you and we'll um, ask them to speak to that. I'll, I'll throw another couple of questions in as well and then give each of the regional um, folks, one, one or both from um, each of the regional perspectives to just give a response. Um, so yeah, lots of comments in here saying thank you for the, for the videos and how much um, they learned. We've got um, one question. Can I call on um, Mr. Riaz Jahuri from, I believe uh, Mr. Jahuri is from the 
Maldives. He's a senior scientific officer at the Research Center for Marine and the Maldives. Mr. Jahuri, you um, had a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and speak to that question? Thank you so much. This is a wonderful opportunity to share our experiences and uh, we are learning a lot from uh, this experience from other island nations such as uh, the Caribbean and the Tuvalu. Thank you, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. I am particularly interested in the design of infrastructure to mitigate uh, uh, climate change impacts. As Maldives is a very low-lying nation, uh, we experience uh, frequent inundation from uh, uh, flooding, from rain, as well as uh, sea surges. So I'm wondering whether Caribbean has any particular design structure that they have successfully proven that this is a very good design to mitigate uh, uh, climate change impacts, uh, such designs that can be used for building uh, schools or other uh, important infrastructure in the Maldives. I would like to ask uh, the Caribbean presenter whether they have any such suggestions for us. Thank you. Yes, um, I think I'll start. The, 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 the report that, um, that Merle referred to um, that was prepared uh, by the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the report is, is entitled uh, Development of Design Guidelines for disaster resilient schools in the OECS. It's a very um, thick document, very technical. It talks about, you know, I mean, first of all, location and, and how you build, you know, the, um, the, the structure, where do you place them, how you build the roads and the, the access roads. So it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite interesting uh, and exciting. Obviously, you know, and, and it was, Put together by technicians, by architects, and um, and um, other people in the technical field. Now, not being too much of a technical person myself, I wouldn't be able to to outline any of these. But that report um, is is available, and uh, it was prepared by the um, the sustainable development. I mean, it's it's for the region, but um, that is one of the. Um, the reports I said that uh, was indebted to the environmental, uh, sustainable environmental unit. And I'm, I'm sure, I, I think it's available and available online. What I would, would, what I would do is to, to find out, you know, from the, um, the coordinator, climate change coordinator at the um, secretariat, how, um, the other people could could access the document. Is it online? Is it uh, you know open to 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 other people? But it is quite quite interesting and and very as I say very detailed. Uh, you know how you what level you put your windows where you put your roads and you know so it is for drought for for you know for floods yeah. for for every risk. Um, associated with climate change, so I think that 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 document, you know, would would, would give um, the gentleman, you know, a very good idea of how you design the schools to make it disaster resilient. I don't know if Merle is on. She did that part of the of the presentation. Merle, are you there? I'm trying to be there. I hope people can hear me. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, we can. My internet has been, okay, great. Um, the internet has been constantly unstable. Um, Dim, all what you said is correct in terms of the te technicality of the report. Um, I think some consideration must be given to the terrain and so on. We are highly um, mountainous, as you know, although most of our schools are on the coast. And a lot of the issues raised in terms of flooding and so on are similar. Um, in terms of the architecture, I think one of the things 
we are grappling with is the cooling, whether we use natural cooling or we use um, solar. And of course, the architecture has been built with the natural cooling in, in, in mind for most of the history of our school um, structures. But I think, Dame, that the document is available. And I think from a question I have seen later on, I don't know, Tara, if I am jumping the gun, but the sharing of information is quite critical because listening to the stories from the Maldives and the South Pacific, um, we identify so closely with it that it brought tears to my eyes listening to the young man saying that he is creating his own floating system. This is quite um, um, emotional to see that at such a young age that our children are thinking so critically about their survival. So um, from my end, anything to help, anything to share, I think from this from time from this moment on, we need to be looking at how we use the resources that we all have to actually allow us to see how we can survive this. So this is my um, initial um, feedback on it. Thanks so much. Thank you both very much for that response. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in, so we'll endeavor to get to as many as possible. We'll be here um, for about another eight to 10 minutes. So I'm going to, in a moment, ask um, Rosie if she'd like to respond to any of the questions that have been raised so far, either by Dan or as you're reading them in the chat. I'm just going to read out a couple of more um, as, as we do that, and you can choose what you feel best poised to respond to. Um, that, a question from Leanne Archer here, who's a doctoral researcher here at the University of Bristol, uh, working on flood modeling in Puerto Rico, and she says, thank you for the excellent talks. If there was one way you think that researchers like me could help amplify your message, what would that be? So maybe Rosie, would you like to take any of those questions and then we'll turn to uh, Muna and Shimmy to do the same. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, well, there was a question about uh, being heard. I mean, I think uh, we are very loud, but we are not heard. Uh, every year there's, uh, there's COP, but no one's, no one's uh, listening and, and uh, responding to, to the needs. Um, I guess they're, um, they're ignoring, you know, it's, 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 COP is like a facade for us in, you know, um, I was in Tuvalu for four years and the conversation between the young boy and uh, the lady really happened. I was there on the beach when, when that conversation Happen. And, you know, it struck me because the, the boy is only five years old, but has already started thinking about what he's going to do. And every day I see these people, they're happy, they're enjoying life as usual. And I thought that that never came to their mind, but I didn't know until that day when that little boy spoke, then I realized, you know, the people, young children are terrified, but what else can they do? Um, I, I've been I've been um, in working on climate change in education for uh, more than ten years, and we've always talked about implementing this in the curriculum, um, so that you know everyone uh, gets to have access uh, to to this information. But we are adapting, we are mitigating. But what are the the, the polluters doing? You know, they give us money to adapt and mitigate. But you know, it doesn't offset the amount of carbon that's given off in those countries that are giving us money to adapt and mitigate while they're not trying you know, to, to change their consumption behavior that, you know, that affects the small countries like, like Tuvalu and also Fiji, whose number of um, coastal communities have relocated uh, because of um, sea level rise. Um, uh, and, you know, they lose a lot of things. Uh, Tuvalu has bought an island in Fiji. Um, Kiribati has also bought an island in Fiji. This is to plant their, their crops and send them back to their countries because the, the soil in these two countries uh, are just barren. You can't grow anything unless you get import soil from Fiji. So, so yeah, so... Um, they're trying their very best, um, uh, coast, uh, coastal adaptation, reclaiming, 
the um, re-engineering uh, the coast so that you know they have enough space to build uh, their their homes. Um, they've uh, developed uh, building codes um, in Fiji. Uh, uh, building codes have been revised so that we can build um, a category five proof um, um, buildings because you know the cyclone is something uh, that affects Fiji. In the past three years, uh, uh, a lot of money has been spent on trying to save lives and save property, um, as well as uh, food crops, uh, uh, because of the damages uh, done, not only by uh, cyclone, but also uh, inundation. Um, and, and with Tuvalu, um, you see the people are happy, but you know, in real life, if you go there, when there's, when there's a king tide, water seeps from beneath and from the sides. So where else can you go? Uh, so, so yeah, so what can we do <laughs> so that they can uh, uh, listen and you know, have that political will to really do something about this? So yeah, so thank you everyone for, for your time. And um, um, uh, you mentioned about the um, desalination plant that was uh, sent to Nauru. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to have been um, to help facilitate the 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 move of that uh, desalination plant. It was sitting in the war for almost a year, and we managed to move it to the USP uh, campus in uh, Nauru so that uh, the people in Nauru can use it. So yeah, Jeff SGP has been doing a lot, um, and their work has been visible. Um, in, 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 in the region as well as um, uh, ADB, but uh, it comes with the cost as well. Eh? Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Rosie. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Leanne. Yes, I would also like to mention, as China mentioned, we are the ocean. And the interesting thing is everyone in the country know that about the sea level rise, but most of them actually don't realize it. Actually, they don't realize the actual effects of what caused climate change in real. I think that's the problem there. There's a gap in what we are actually talking about and what really happens. I, I, if we can amplify this, that would help, I think. Thank you. Sarah, if I may just add, um, currently, uh, the University of the South Pacific with two other universities in Fiji, the um, University of Fiji and the Fiji National University of the South Pacific, um, Fiji National University is working with UCL, University College of London on, um, on a project, um, um, uh, the, the, the title is Transforming Universities for, for Changing Climate. And um, it, it was a partnership uh, with the USP, but then we've extended our activity to the other two universities so that we can go out to the community to reach out to them, to build capacity, to create awareness, uh, as well as build communities so that they are more resilient. I think that's what we can do. Um, write these stories, tell these stories, pass it on to the next generation. Um, and that's all we can do, but uh, the, the political will has to be from our leaders who will really make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're just going to run out of time now and I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everyone for your important questions. And I hope that there's been a little bit of a dialogue in the chat here, but we haven't been able to get to all of them, but thank you for the reminders about faith and hope needing, needing to be part of this. It's not a message of um, just uh, urgency is also a message of, of hope and optimism, and that is extremely important here. Um, just wanted to thank all of the presenters who put together fantastic videos. Um, it wasn't initially the plan to have three uh, full videos, but this is a wonderful resource um, to have. So thank you. That takes immense effort for everyone to have been able to do that. So thank you. Um, for all of that energy that you've put into that. Thank you again to um, Christy and the team at the School of Education here. Thank you very much to Dan Mitchell for um, representing Cabot Institute and giving us some context to what today is about and also responding so thoughtfully to all three of the presentations. 
And um, thank you to Michael Crossley, who helped to organize and bring us all together and add to spark the idea of this event. So just as a reminder, um, we this is, as you can see, being recorded. And as we said at the beginning, um, it will be edited into um, a fully edited, full length, but also a shortened version, which we would like to get into the hands of those at COP. So if you know individuals who will be present, that we can give them the link to the YouTube video will go on to the Cabot Institute website. Thank you very much to the Cabot Institute for giving that platform to us. Um, and um, we would love to hear from you. So you can contact um, myself or Professor Crossley at Bristol University if you have suggestions of who we could get this uh, edited video to. But um, thank you so much. Michael, did you want to have one final word before we sign off today? Well, I guess a big thank you to absolutely everybody who's been involved in this and, and to you, Tara, for chairing so well. It's been a, a combination of different time zones across the globe. So um, not an easy one to pull together and uh, everyone's done a wonderful job today. Thank you. Lovely to see you all there. Thank you all very much and we'll follow up with your emails that you sent us on the registration with the video once it's available. Have a wonderful rest of your day and stay in touch. Thank you.